to make sure that if you're not if you're not receiving sufficient amount of carbs from your diet, then cortisol rises adaptively and it's going to shed first your muscles, then your skin, uh, then eventually some of the vital organs. And the last one to go is usually the heart because without a heart, you die, right? So cortisol's role is to protect the brain, which consumes about 40% of your carbs daily. Mm. Uh, it's such a such a uh, in, intense sugar consuming organ. And if you don't feed it, then the, in order to prevent the coma, which happens that uh, when, when blood sugar drops too low, cortisol is always going to be there. And the less sugar you eat, the more cortisol will rise to compensate for that. But guess what? If cortisol rises, means insulin is being blocked from doing its job. If cortisol rises, within five minutes after cortisol spiking, adrenaline also rises. And that means increased lipolysis. So by restricting your carbohydrates, you actually amplify the effects of stress. Even if you're not under stress, you will cause a stress response because that's what the body needs its calories, it needs its carbs, especially the brain, in order to keep you alive. Welcome to the Win at Life podcast, a place where we share everything you need to know about restoring your metabolism so you can break free from restrictive diets and build a body and life you love. I'm Kitty Bloomfield, co-founder of New Strength and your host for this episode. Today, I'm joined by our friend, founder of Idea Labs and researcher Georgie Dinkoff. For those of you who don't know Georgie, he's an IT professional by day and researcher by night, focusing on biochemistry and physiology. If you follow me for a while, you'll know I've cycled through nearly every diet out there. For 17 years of my life, I tried to cut all sugar from my diet, including fruit and juice. And I get so many comments on my post saying sugar causes diabetes and sugar causes insulin resistance. So I thought it'd be a great idea to sit down with Georgie and address some of these misconceptions. In this episode, he covers what is insulin resistance? What actually causes insulin resistance and diabetes? Hint, it's not sugar. The role chronic stress has in diabetes and insulin resistance. What happens when you go low carb and or low calorie? What dietary changes can a diabetic or someone who suffers from insulin resistance make to improve their condition? Glycine's relationship with insulin and the supplements Georgie recommends to help improve insulin resistance. Now, don't forget about our monthly podcast. Once you finish listening to this episode, take a screenshot and share it on Instagram stories and tag me at K-I-T-T-Y-B-L-O-M-F-I-E-L-D and share what you loved most about the episode. Each month we'll pick a winner and they'll receive a tub of saturated premium collagen valued at $79. Let's get into the episode. Oh, welcome back, Georgie. Georgie Dinkov. Um, amazing. Jo- Georgie's got this, obviously people who listen to the podcast can't see you, but Georgie's got this amazing mic now, which means he's so much clearer, which is good. Hopefully, better sound that I'm not skipping. I'm not, yeah. yeah. There's no cracking. (laughs) People can actually hear me, right? (laughs) It looks impressive too. And Georgie, uh, which I mentioned already, but has just incredible supplements. Um, I think we've got nearly everyone, probably. (laughs) Um, And yeah, head over to his website, check those out. I'll put the link um, down below in the show notes. And obviously, if you have any questions, you can just email him. There's an email there. But uh, I wanted to get Georgie on today to talk about uh, the real cause of insulin resistance and diabetes, because I get so many comments on my posts, oh, sugar causes diabetes, sugar causes insulin resistance. You know, a lot of women who've got PCOS and endometriosis, they're told to cut sugar and cut carbs. And, you know, that's actually doing them more harm harm than good. So I just thought, let's get you on because you're amazing and (laughs) so knowledgeable. And you can, uh, you know, just sort of break down some of these myths. So I'm trying to think where we should start. So maybe um, what is insulin resistance? Maybe we should start there. What what is it? What does it mean? Just the inability of the cell um, to respond. Like basically when you're ingesting sugar, typically mm. you get an, you get an insulin release from the pancreas in, in order for the, the to, for the, for there to be an uptake of the sugar inside of the cell. Mm-hmm. Now, as it turns out, actually insulin only plays about maybe 15 to 20% of the uptake of sugar inside of the cell. The other 80% up to 80% is due to potassium. So you can actually develop insulin resistance by simply restricting potassium in the diet. Many people don't think about it because it's such a simple mineral, but you can actually get insulin resistance by restricting this simple, um, you know, alkaline mineral. Um, and um, it's you present know what, everywhere. Georgie, like, yeah, yeah. That makes so much sense because so many of the women that come to us, like me, they, um, 
were told that, you know, sugar is so bad that you should stop eating fruit. So like I, I now I drink heaps of juice. I eat oranges. I love oranges. Mm-hmm. Um, I eat lots of fruit, lots of juice. And, you know, it's, they're all high in potassium and, you know, they're told, okay, cut, a lot of them have completely cut sugar. They've, they've cut fruit out of their diet and then they're eating a ton of seeds, nuts, vegetable oils. So that's a really, I didn't, I knew that obviously, I knew that potassium acted like insulin helped to push it into the cell, but I didn't know that it was that much. Well, it's the majority of the actual, what is being ascribed to insulin is actually due to potassium. And then the rest, it's so basically you can do, you can, you can get away with very little insulin, provided two things are present. First, sufficient potassium. And second, uh, basically uh, low levels of free fatty acids in the blood, because the free fatty acids actually can block the insulin receptor. And that's one of the reasons why people with, uh, I mean, you can immediately say, you see, it's not uh, that the insulin resistance is not a sugar problem because most of the people with insulin resistance are overweight and most of that extra weight is fat, right? So Mm. there should be immediately... Uh, I don't know, like an intuitive connection between fat and insulin resistance, but not so much sugar and insulin resistance. And people say, well, doesn't sugar make you fat? Well, sugar actually, in order for you to synthesize fats from sugar, it's been shown that in humans, you need to eat about a pound or more before you even start synthesizing the fats from the sugar, right? Um, It's actually the dietary fat in your diet that mostly makes you fat. The, The easiest way to get very, very fat is to eat a very high percentage of fat in your diet. And what's high percentage? Well, usually... Uh, in the animal studies, they say that if you eat, um, if they put the animals on a, a fat diet that's more than 30% of the calories, they very quickly get fat. And mm-hmm. it, even if they restrict the, the carbohydrates, the animals still get fat. So the, the data that we have from every animal model out there, whether it's a rodent, a kangaroo, a, a monkey, um, a dog, a cat, or whatnot, because all of these have been used as animal models, demonstrate conclusively that if you put the animals on a on a diet that contains more than 30% of the calories as fat, over time, they will get actually fat. And the insulin resistance has been shown to invariably develop after the animals increase their adiposity beyond a certain percentage level. Um, I think it's like 25% or more body fat, you're actually starting to ask for trouble. And people say, well, why? Well, because the more fat you, you store, uh, and you, especially if you're under stress, this elevates your baseline lipolysis, which means how much fat you actually shed into the bloodstream. Uh, now, if you're a relatively unstressed individual, you don't do much during the day, even if you're very, very obese, you actually can paradoxically, quote unquote, have a very, very good insulin sensitivity. Um, they call it the obesity paradox. In about 15 to 20% of extremely obese, morbidly obese people, they present with no metabolic abnormalities. They have, they have normal cholesterol, normal triglycerides, normal free fatty acids in the blood, and normal blood pressure. So uh, it's part of the so-called obesity paradox. And doctors have been trying to explain it away as a statistical abnormality, but it has been confirmed over and over and over again. So what does it, when does a person become insulin resistant? Well, first you got to put on the extra pounds. And second, the role of stress should never be underestimated. It's, Mm -hmm. you can actually turn a very skinny person into fully type one diabetic. If you put them through extreme stress And uh, if you look at the studies on humans, it shows that most people who develop type one diabetes after birth, in other words, it's not, it's not something that was innate and the baby was born with, they developed as a result of some kind of an extremely stressful event uh, and a physical and or emotional trauma. Being in a car accident is a very common uh, cause of developing diabetes as a child, even as an adult. Um, And basically the extreme stress of such an event floods the bloodstream with a, a normal amount of cortisol and, and free fatty acids. And both of these have really uh, extremely toxic effect on the beta cells in the pancreas. So you can destroy the pancreas to the point of not being able to produce enough insulin. And that's what makes you type one diabetic. The less extreme case, which is type two diabetes, um, is basically a combination of obesity and insulin resistance. And if that doesn't get treated properly, in other words, protecting the pancreas from this uh, elevated lipolysis, you can actually eventually become a type 1 diabetic, insulin-dependent diabetes. You don't have to be skinny. Most of the type 1 diabetics are skinny because they uh, you know, they have very poor utilization of amino acids and, and they, they eventually become gaunt if they don't control their insulin and blood sugar levels well. But you can get to that point uh, if you have t- type 2 diabetes, which is usually accompanied by obesity and insulin resistance, right? But if yeah. you don't control it well, eventually you could become insulin dependent. 
Um, mm. It's the final stage of, of type 2 diabetes. The more mild version is insulin resistance, which is seen in mild obesity, right? But it's not just the obesity that is that that, it, that is sufficient. The stress is also there because ultimately, what causes you the, uh, the what causes the inability to process sugar properly mm. is an excessive presence of free fatty acids in the blood. They block the insulin receptor, right? Mm. So, so this means the body will say, "Oh, I don't, I don't, I don't have enough insulin, so let me produce more." So, mm. a very common um, a blood they call it a blood picture, um, a very common uh, a biomarker. Um, analysis, if you look at the, the biomarkers done for people with type 2 diabetes or insulin resistance, it's like these people have high blood sugar and also very, very high insulin, right? The insulin is outside of the normal range. Why? Because the body's producing more because the one that's there, it's not doing its job properly. That's why it's called insulin resistance. You're capable of producing the insulin, but you're not reacting to it properly. And why wouldn't you react properly to insulin? Well, if, if there's something there blocking the effects of insulin, the body needs to, to compensate for that and produce that much more in order to achieve the the same effects, right? So it, so insulin is like the key that unlocks the door. So exactly. when there's exactly. too much free fatty acids in the blood, it blocks that key and blocks cortisol key. as well. So high stress, high exactly. free fatty acids. So it's this yep. toxic combination. So I guess, you know, when people go, oh, but I reduced all the carbs and sugar in my diet and improved my symptoms. Well, it's just, obviously you're reducing You just it. up your cortisol when you, yeah. when you reduce the carbs you, because the, so look, the, 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 Two main roles of cortisol are number one, maintaining blood sugar, uh, like to to be to stay above zero. Because mm. if your blood sugar drops beyond, it doesn't have to reach zero. If it drops below fifty, you're mm. you're you're going you're actually almost instantly going to a coma. Like the type one that type one diabetic people, they, they have to play a very careful game of like not injecting too much insulin. Because if mm. they do, then their blood sugar drops too much and they can go into diabetic coma and die. So mm -hmm. it's like you don't want your blood sugar to drop too low. And that's the primary role of cortisol. Because since you, you, uh, you uh, I mean, every adult, uh, even, a, even a child, you, we have body mass, right? And mm -hmm. almost everything in your body can get converted into glucose, including the fats, right? But predominantly protein and things and, and bone tissue, mm -hmm. of which 30% is collagen, which is another type of protein. Mm -hmm. So cortisol's second role is actually to, uh, to, to make sure that if you're not if you're not receiving sufficient amount of carbs from your diet, then cortisol rises adaptively and it's going to shed first your muscles, then your skin, uh, then eventually some of the vital organs. And the last one to go is usually the heart because without a heart, you die, right? Mm -hmm. um, so cortisol's role is to protect the brain, which consumes about 40% of your carbs daily. Mm -hmm. uh, it's such a such a uh, in intense sugar consuming organ. And if you don't feed it, then the, in order to prevent the coma, which happens that uh, when, when blood sugar drops too low, cortisol is always going to be there. And the less sugar you eat, the more cortisol will rise to compensate for that. But guess what? If cortisol rises, means insulin is being blocked from doing its job. If cortisol rises, within five minutes after cortisol spiking, adrenaline also rises, and that means increased lipolysis. So by restricting your carbohydrates, you actually amplify the effects of stress. Even if you're not under stress, you will cause a stress response because that's what the body needs its calories, it needs its carbs, especially the brain, in order to keep you alive. And if, these, if the carbs are not there, then you've basically replicated the stress reaction. Now, what happens during stress? Well, you know, evolutionary, if you're being chased by a saber-toothed tiger or like a bear or something, right? Um, so the body uh, uh, shuts off some of the functions that are not considered, uh, you know, necessary for survival at this moment uh, at the expense of rising cortisol and rising adrenaline. It wants to give you extreme amounts of energy very, very quickly. So mm. what this means is cortisol rises and you start essentially converting, shedding your muscles um, and bone and other tissues and converting massive amounts of these amino acids that are coming from those tissues, converting them into glucose inside of the liver, right? Mm -hmm. But if stress stops, this whole process is supposed to stop. But if stress becomes chronic, then you can get into a situation where you're chronically overproducing cortisol. It's not too much to get to the level of, let's say, something like Cushing syndrome, but mm. uh, Cushing disease. But you're getting into the levels of something called Cushing syndrome, which is a milder version. Cushing disease caused by tumor in the pituitary gland, which causes the overproduction of cortisol. But guess mm. what? 
a prime symptom slash sign symptom of Cushing disease is insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. So entirely caused by the overproduction of cortisol. So if you're overstressing yourself chronically, you can, even if you don't get to the Cushing disease thing because you don't have a tumor in the pituitary, but if you're stressing over yourself for too much or for too long, then basically you get to the point where we start to exhibiting very similar phenotype, which is central obesity, loss of muscle mass, and extremely thin limbs. It's called the lemon and sticks model. And that's what people either with Cushing disease or Cushing syndrome end up having. And recent studies demonstrated you can actually cure Cushing syndrome and type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance simply by administering a cortisol blocker uh, known as the RU486, which is uh, famously known as being an abortion pill. But not many people know that it was designed in the 1980s originally as a cortisol blocker. However, um, you know, the uh, French company Sanofi that developed it, um, the, the marketing department uh, looked at the drug and said, great, guys, uh, great achievement for science, but we're not going to be able to sell much of that. So what can we do with this nice chemical that you just synthesized? Oh, it, it's also capable of blocking the progesterone receptor. Guess what happens when you block the progesterone receptor in a pregnant woman? She immediately aborts. And the feminist movement is rising. A lot of women will be uh, will be willing to pay for, for the morning after pill or for abortion pill. Well, guess what? Let's start marketing this pill as an abortion pill, even though its primary function by design was to block the effects of excess cortisol. But And now they're starting to realize that you can actually cure insulin resistance and to type diabetes simply by blocking the effects of excessive cortisol. Um, mm-hmm. And that, that should give you the idea that since cortisol is the hormone of stress, even if every mainstream doctor will admit that, you can the, the a, anybody who has insulin resistance or type 2 diabetes or even type 1 diabetes is a prime candidate for investigation of whether their hypothalamopituitary adrenal, adrenal axis is dysregulated. In other words, if they suffer from low grade hypercortisolemia, right? To the point where they're not in the Cushing disease range yet, but they're in the Cushing syndrome, which means big bulging belly, right? Sagging mm-hmm. chest, right? And a moon face, and then basically very thin limbs. Um, and most people with type 2 diabetes or insulin resistance are somewhere on that spectrum, right? That they're, they're not very healthy looking. They <laughs> usually have central obesity. And um, so, George, it's just so interesting, you know, like, when these women come in, they're like, oh, the recommendation that's been given to us is I've got to cut all the sugar out, all of the carbs, you know, eat more nuts, eat more seeds, um, you know, eat more vegetable oils. What's the problem with that advice? Well, you're, the more fat you eat, the more fat is going to end up in your bloodstream. And then the more fat you have in your, in your bloodstream, the less insulin, the less well insulin is going to be able to work. It's, it's, it's well known. And in fact, one of the oldest treatments to this day, which is still tried, is that they put these type 2 diabetic people on, on a hyper calorically restricted diet. In other words, if normally they need to eat 2,500 calories to, to get by and feel okay, they put them on an 800 calorie diet a day without restricting the sugar, but they do mm. restrict the fat. So mm. after these people lose all of the excess weight, unfortunately, they lose muscle mass and fat. But mm. after they lose all of the excess fat, their type 2 diabetes is considered cured. But unfortunately, by restricting the calories for so long, let's say a couple of months in order to lose all of mm. the excess weight, you lost all of your muscle mass as well. Because when you restrict calories, cortisol, again, rises adaptively to keep the blood sugar at a certain level. So what happens, these people cure their type 2 diabetes, but in the process, they lower their basal metabolic rate so much that they now they have to stay on that 800 calorie diet for life or otherwise, as soon as they increase it by a little bit, they start packing on the pounds again because they destroy their metabolic rate uh, by losing all of this extra muscle mass. So if you're eating these extra fats, you're essentially giving yourself insulin resistance almost immediately. There's a famous video, and I'll send it to you. There's a guy who drinks uh, uh, like a glass of olive oil to see what happens uh, you know, to his, to his blood markers. He becomes insulin resistant almost immediately within the next 15 minutes. And this continues for as long as his blood continues to demonstrate elevated levels of, of basically this, these fats from the olive oil. Now, everybody thinks, oh, olive oil is great. It's healthy. Yeah. Well, in moderation. <laughs> if you, if you, but it serves, the, it serves to the, as an example to demonstrate if you overconsume fats, that will actually get you 
into insulin resistance within a day, within actually a mm. few hours. And you stay in that level, right, until this extra fat is clear from the bloodstream. As mm. soon as his, his uh, uh, blood lipid levels drop down to his, his, the, the, the prior levels before in j- drinking that glass of olive oil, he basically, his blood sugar also dropped, right? So, mm. so here, he actually consumed no sugar. The only, only thing he did is he, he drank a glass of olive oil and immediately his blood lipids shot up and his blood glucose shot up without, even though he was in the process of restricting dietary carbohydrates, he ingested Mm -hmm. zero carbs. The only thing he ingested is about 250 grams of olive oil. And that was enough to basically make him, uh, at least on a blood work, make him look type two diabetic. Uh, And he basically stayed, like didn't consume anything for a few hours and kept checking his blood, doing like blood tests. And over the course of, I think, six to eight hours, I'll send you the YouTube video. Mm. Uh, the youtube video he basically his his parameters normalized but i'll put it in the show notes so people can watch it yeah send it to me send it so let's talk about then georgie so if someone was you know insulin resistant or type 2 diabetic what dietary changes could they make I would uh, watch the fat. Uh, I would certainly not consume the nuts and seeds. Uh, I, I have posted a few studies recently on my blog demonstrating that a few studies in India, and I think one was in Australia, demonstrated the consumption of nuts and seeds, especially in girls, actually causes type 2 diabetes. Mm. So it was a great shock to the scientists themselves because they thought they would actually see a beneficial effect by replacing the saturated fats with with the, the polyunsaturated fats, which are present in uh, predominantly in the nuts and seeds and some of the fatty fishes. But Actually, yeah. they saw the opposite. The, the women, the, and those are young girls. They weren't mm. overweight, but they became overweight. These were girls in the age of like in the age range of twelve to sixteen, and they got themselves diabetic over time, or at least insulin resistant, simply by consuming this extra amount of like uh, the healthy fats, which mm. most doctors will say, yeah, load up on the seeds, load up on the on the nuts. It's really good for you. Uh, mm-hmm. I think most of the benefits that people are seeing from the nuts and seeds come from some of the minerals that are inside because many of those are very rich in selenium and zinc. And both of these are very important for supporting the function of the pancreas. Mm-hmm. Um, so if anybody sees benefits, most likely coming from some of the trace trace uh, elements inside mm-hmm. of the nuts and seeds and not uh, probably not from the unsaturated fats that are, that, that are loaded in there. So we want to reduce or eliminate the PUFAs. So nuts, seeds, yeah. fish oil, um, seed oils, flax seed oil, oil, any kind of a vegetable oil, uh, yep. basically like, uh, so the, uh, uh, since olives is a fruit, so mm. fruit oil should be okay. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, so olive oil, but in moderation, because uh, olive oil is predominantly mono unsaturated fats, but mm. it contains about 10 to 15% PUFAs too. Mm. Um, so uh, about a spoon, tablespoon or two per day is probably okay. So using as like it's probably a probably m- most people wouldn't even use that anyway. Like I, right. pro- I probably only have a teaspoon a day just on my carrot salad. So olive oil, like, so folks on saturated fats, so butter, ghee, butter, tallow, right? Yep, tallow. Coconut oil, things like that. Yeah. So anything saturated, like a, like a chocolate fat. Mm. So like mm. get, get yourself butter. some great milk chocolate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Chocolate butter. <laughs> yeah. Um, they're mostly rich in the palmitic and stearic acids mm. um, and they're fully saturated. And they, they, in addition to, uh, so when you eat those, they actually don't have the same insulin blocking effects that mm. the polyunsaturated fats do. Number one, number two, the polyunsaturated fats are actually precursors to the highly inflammatory mediators known as prostaglandins and leukotrienes. And some of the most successful drugs used clinically for the last half a century, if not more, are actually blocking the enzymes that process the PUFA and turn it into the inflammatory mediators. So well, instead of taking those drugs, one of which is aspirin, how about don't, just don't load up on the PUFA to start with, right? Mm. In addition, uns- unsaturated fats are structurally similar to estrogen um, and actually can uh, sort of like, even if you if estrogen levels are low, if you consume a sufficient amount of polyunsaturated fats, you're actually giving your tissues a very estrogenic signal and they mm-hmm. synergize with, it, with estrogen. You may be producing little estrogen, but if you're consuming a lot of PUFA, that estrogen will do the work uh, of like as if you were producing five to 10 times more. Uh, mm. while, uns- while saturated fats actually have the opposite effects. Um, and an old study uh, published in the 60s demonstrated that there is, a, there is this very tight correlation between estrogenicity and un- unsaturatedness, and then conversely, anti-estrogenicity and saturatedness. So the more saturated the fat is, the more anti-estrogenic the effects will be. For males, it may even have androgenic effects, uh, while in females, we'll mostly be able to block the effects of, of, est- of excess estrogen. 
I hope you're enjoying the episode so far. I just wanted to jump in and quickly talk about saturated premium collagen. Now, you would have heard Georgie talk about glycine and how it can decrease insulin resistance. Glycine is an amino acid that's found in high amounts in gelatin, which is basically the cooked form of collagen. Traditional diets were naturally gelatin rich. Muscle meat wasn't generally eaten on its own like it is today. Usually a whole joint was stewed, the muscle, the bone, the skin, the connective tissue and cartilage, which meant you got the full spectrum of amino acids in one meal, including a good dose of glycine. These days we throw away all the good bits. I like to make gelatinous broths and use gelatinous cuts of meat like beef cheeks in conjunction with saturated premium collagen, which is basically gelatin that's been further processed to make hydrolyzed collagen. The beauty of hydrolyzed collagen is that you can mix it in food or liquids and it won't go hard like gelatin. It's an easy way to get more gelatin and glycine in your diet. I like to mix it into my morning coffee, add it to yogurts, add it to smoothies, as well as mix it in juice. I'll pop a link as well as a discount code in the show notes that you can use when you purchase. Let's get back to the podcast. Um, so really, yeah, like, I mean, uh, whatever your grandma used to eat, I mean, Australia is a country that used to have a lot of sheep, a lot of cattle, right? Yeah. A lot of goats. That's what people used to eat. And so they did not have any of these problems. Animals, yeah, eggs, raised, exactly. eggs. And what about, let's talk about carbs. What sort of carbs should they be focusing on and eating? Ideally ripe fruit. You mm-hmm. mentioned oranges. Um, yep. I, there are several human studies demonstrating that if you drink even half a liter of orange juice, your blood sugar actually doesn't even rise to the level of what they would consider, the, they call it postprandial. In other words, after eating. Um, mm-hmm. So if you're only drinking the orange juice, the high amount of potassium and some of the flav- flavonoid chemicals that are in there, such as naringin uh, mm-hmm. and naringin, are actually helping you process the sugar properly and getting it shuttling inside of the cell and having it metabolized properly into carbon dioxide and water instead of floating around, right? And mm-hmm. also orange juice was shown to block the effects of endotoxin, which mm-hmm. endotoxin has a great insulin resistance promoting effect. Very common protocol in animal studies, but to make, to turn animals, to make animals insulin resistant, even if they're not obese, even if they're lean and muscular, is by injecting endotoxin into their blood. Something about endotoxin, probably because of its highly pro-inflammatory nature, because mm-hmm. it, it, it makes your body uh, react as if you're under some kind of an infectious attack, like a bacteria and- or a mm-hmm. virus infected you, right? And b- when that happens, the body actually raises the blood sugar adaptively because it's needed it's to give, be given to the cells to protect against the, uh, the, the infectious pathogen. Well, if you keep doing that, if you keep giving that, you know, um, uh, lipopolysaccharide endotoxin injection chronically, you, you can give animals insulin resistance in type 2 diabetes even while they're still lean. So um, maybe the adrenal cocktail would be a good one. So coconut water, orange juice, salt, some collagen with the potassium, yep, the high excellent. potassium, ripe yep. fruits, um, yep. honey. What about some starches? So like potatoes, white rice, would you say always eat them with some fruits and saturated fats and protein? Exactly. Yes. Yep. So some help fruits, you balance. some saturated fats, some protein. Yep. Collagen is great always. Uh, yep. Studies have shown that actually by giving the isolated amino acid glycine to people, mm. you can actually completely block, just like orange juice, you normally when you eat something sweet, your mm. blood sugar spikes for like a few hours and then like it's supposed to go down to baseline. But if you give people that extra sugar, even if it's white sugar, pure white sugar with some collagen or have them drink the sugar in the form of orange juice, even if these people drink half a liter of orange juice, which is about 100 grams of sugar, uh, but I think it's at least if not even more, that mm. the blood sugar doesn't rise, doesn't even get close to the level that they experience when they're eating a normal meal, which means something in the orange juice... Um, that's probably the potassium and the flavonoids are mm. making that sugar very quickly metabolizable without mm. even causing an insulin response. That's the other thing. It, blood sugar didn't rise much and insulin didn't rise much. So it, 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 it gave you like it gave a very good insulin sensitizing effect, regardless of a pretty high amount of sugar in that orange juice. And so would collagen, you, yeah. Yeah. sorry, keep going. I was just going to ask you. Yeah, collagen has the same effects. Probably, uh, two, two, probably two mechanisms, main mechanisms of action. One, all of the amino acids in collagen are highly anti-inflammatory, number one. Mm. Number two, they, they're capable of blocking the endotoxin receptor. So if you have if you suffer from like leaky gut or you're carrying some extra pounds, which tends to mm. increase the gut permeability, it mm. means you'll probably be under like a low-grade 
uh, uh, endotoxemia, not enough mm. to cause liver failure or, or like a, or like a multi-organ failure, but mm. enough to keep you in a chronically inflamed state and a chronically insulin resistant state. All of the amino acids in, in collagen are known to be able to either fully block or greatly reduce that inflammatory effect of endotoxin. And the second part is somehow uh, glycine seems to act and to amplify the effects of insulin and also protects the beta cells in the pancreas from the detrimental effects of both cortisol and the free fatty acids. So when you're eating collagen, you're protecting your pancreas directly, which would allow it to produce insulin to start with. And also because somehow insulin amplifies, I'm sorry, glycine, glycine amplifies the effects of insulin, then the pancreas doesn't even have to produce as much in order to achieve the same uh, sh uh, increased sugar uptake into the cell. So, Georgie, if someone would say they've come from a really high fat, low carb diet like keto, would you recommend that they gradually increase their carb intake? Depends on their on their body weight. If they've yeah. gained like a significant a significant amount of body weight, because yeah. the my experience with the low carb and keto diets, which I myself had for a while, is yeah. that you lose a lot of body weight in the first couple of months, but most of the loss of weight is actually water. When you cut carbs, it has a, a bit of a diuretic effect. Mm. Um, and basically people say, oh, I'm losing all of this, all of this weight, but you're actually not losing much fat initially. You're losing mm. mostly water. And then after the, after the first couple of weeks, then cortisol starts to get upregulated. So then you start seeing these benefits disappear. First of all, they weren't that much of a benefit anyways, because most of that extra weight you lost about 80% was water. You did lose some fat. You also lost some muscle because you restricted carbs, right? And after a few weeks that that upregulated baseline cortisol starts to rise, right? Mm. And then cortisol can actually start making you retain water yet again. And mm. many of the chronic chronic keto, like low carb keto slash paleo practitioners are now finding that basically they cannot go on a low carb for the entire day. They need a little bit of sugar because they start ballooning because of all of that extra water retention. Because if cortisol rises sufficiently, it starts to activate the mineralocorticoid receptor, which is what aldosterone um, activates and you start retaining sodium. If you start mm. retaining sodium, you start retaining water, right? Mm. So basically, uh, if people are coming from a low carb paleo, like keto background, if they've already packed on the pounds, then I would do first like a, maybe a hormonal uh, like blood test, make sure that the cortisol is not high because mm. if it is high, then you, you may need to take some anti-cortisol measures in order for things to normalize because while your cortisol is high, even if you change your diet drastically, um, you're probably not going to be very feeling very well initially because mm. if cortisol is high, it's going to prevent the proper metabolism of that sugar. And in fact, cortisol increases the synthesis of fat from sugar. So if your baseline cortisol is high, just as the study with RU486 demonstrated in the Cushing syndrome, no matter what you eat, you'll be packing on the pounds in the, around the midriff and then you'll be losing muscle mass in your extremities. So you have to put cortisol under control if it's out of control. If it's not, then I think gradually increasing carbs, just as you said, don't go overboard initially, you know, immediately like load up on the carbs, right? Mm. Because like when you're, when you've been low carbing for a while, cortisol will be upregulated, even if it's not reaching the pathological stages. Remember, we're restricting carbs. You're sending the signal to the body that things are not all right. You know, mm. the, the environment is not optimal. The body says, oh, I got to keep the brain alive. So I will jump a little bit just so I can provide this extra bit of sugar, make sure that the blood sugar stays at a certain level, doesn't drop too low because then you're going to the coma. And I think finally, Georgie, can you talk about um, any supplements that might be beneficial for people to use? Like for example, niacinamide. Yes, niacinamide and aspirin are probably two of the simplest and widely available supplements. And they're really good because um, they, both of them have anti-lipolytic effect. So they're going to restrict the excess lipolysis, which will improve the ability of your insulin to do its job, right? And then basically will give you the, your, your cells break through the rando cycle because fats mm -hmm. and glucose compete all the time for oxidation. And if you lower the, the supply of fat, which is coming from lipolysis to your cells, they should be able to start like mm -hmm. uh, metabolizing the glucose a little bit better number one number two both uh, niacinamide and aspirin actually have anti-cortisol effect the salicylic acid which is a metabolite of aspirin if you take aspirin aspirin this chemical name is acetyl salicylic acid which means salicylic acid just bound with acetic acid together right mm. so when you ingest it in the body it breaks down into acetic acid and salicylic acid salicylic acid is an inhibitor of the enzyme that synthesizes cortisol that enzyme is 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type 1 
And there is a human study, only one, but very famous, where they show that extremely obese, highly insulin resistant type 2 diabetic people, they were able to immediately, almost immediately go back to normal insulin sensitivity while still remaining extremely fat by taking uh, 90 milligrams per kilogram of body weight aspirin. That's a massive amount. So if, you, if you're weighing 100 kilos, that's nine grams of aspirin daily, yeah. right? But they did it. It worked without like a charm for every single one of the participants in the study. They couldn't explain why. Well, one explanation now that we know that cortisol is intimately involved in insulin resistance is that if salicylic acid inhibits the synthesis of cortisol, that it's going to restore your normal hormonal balance. Mm-hmm. Niacinamide it's a pre- is a precursor. First of all, also anti-lipolytic effect, right? But also niacinamide gets converted to something called NAD, nicotinamide mm-hmm. adenine dinucleotide. And uh, the, this enzyme that, that synthesizes cortisol is also, it's actually bidirectional. It can actually take cortisol as an input and deactivate it into an inactive form of cortisol called cortisone, right? Mm. But that enzyme, whether it synthesizes cortisol or deactivates cortisol back into cortisone depends on the availability of NAD and the NAD to the NADH ratio. The higher the amount of NAD in your body, the more you will convert the detrimental cortisol back into the inactive cortisone, right? So taking niacinamide will lower lipolysis, allow you to deactivate cortisol. And if you take aspirin, will lower lipolysis and inhibit the synthesis of cortisol. Why not do both? And Mm -hmm. this way you get the best of both worlds. Just a single tablet of aspirin with a single tablet of niacinamide is probably enough to resolve most How many of grams of that be, Joji? How many grams? Uh, 500 milligrams of niacinamide. Yeah. And let's say 500 milligrams of aspirin, even yeah. if taken once daily, um, mm. it's probably going to be enough for most people because salicylic acid, even though aspirin has a very short half life, remember, mm. aspirin is a prodrug. It gets metabolized into salicylic acid, which itself has a very long half life, about 30 hours. So, which mm. means that if you, even if you take only one aspirin daily, over time, you will build up the silica- salicylic acid to the levels that will help you. Uh, basically stop producing that much cortisol. And mm-hmm. with the niacinamide, it will have a synergistic effect. Recent study of a company that sells a another NAD precursor known as nicotinamide riboside. It's probably now getting advertised a lot in Australia as well. The mm-hmm. company Chromadex is the one that patented it and it's selling its pills, sponsored a study with obese female subjects and gave them, I think, 300 milligrams of nicotinamide, nicotinamide riboside, which ultimately converts to NAD, just like niacinamide. Mm-hmm. And after two months, their insulin resistance was greatly reduced. Uh, it's just 300 milligrams. Now, niacinamide is dirt cheap. And actually, it's a better precursor <laughs> than nicotinamide riboside and, and gets converted uh, more effectively into NAD, much cheaper, right? And you can get like, uh, you know, I don't know if they have lower the, the 500 milligrams, but 500 milligrams daily, you should be able to more than replicate the results of this. I'm, I'm, underli- I'm emphasizing human study. One of the first human studies demonstrating that, that raising NAD levels have a really beneficial effect on insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes without necessarily uh, curing obesity but over time mm-hmm. if you're if you restore your insulin sensitivity you should be able to consume sugar without that converting into fat and over time you should be able to gradually lose that extra extra pounds that you have and georgie actually just one more thing before we finish off is can you just talk about fructose because i think fructose gets this like ridiculously bad rap and everyone thinks that it's bad <laughs> I don't know why, because fructose actually has been known as a, uh, you know, one of the few uh, true sugars that diabetics can consume. Uh, my father has a type 2 diabetes, and he survives almost entirely on fructose. Um, and his doctor actually is the one who recommended it. Now, there seems to be a, a big dichotomy, or at least a split in the opinion of fructose between the Western world and like the, I don't want to call it the Eastern world, but like <laughs> several countries in Europe actually are selling fructose and actively advertising it as very, very beneficial for diabetes. While most of the studies that are published in the US and the UK and Germany are saying, oh my God, fructose is the devil. It's going to fatten up your liver. It will make you insulin resistant. It will actually make you diabetic. Well, these are so uh, diametrically opposed that only one of these can be true. Well, my father has maintained his type 2 diabetes under control without taking any drugs by simply 
making sure that he, he eats, he does not restrict carbs. He actually eats even white bread, but he actually supplements with about a tablespoon of fructose. And because the fructose helps the utilization of glucose and helps lower lipolysis as well, this basically kind of has the similar effects to aspirin and niacinamide. It increases your insulin sensitivity. In addition, fructose activates the enzyme pyruvate dehydrogenase, which is the, the rate limiting, so-called rate limiting step in the metabolism of glucose. So if you are insulin resistant and all, let's say the sugar manages to somehow get inside of your cell, because most insulin resistant people also are, are, have a lot of fat in their bodies and in the bloodstream and in the cell, due to the Randall cycle, the fat will be basically flooded with too much fat, right? And this means they cannot metabolize the glucose. And this glucose will pass through the glycolysis cycle and at the end of the glycolysis cycle, the, the, the cell will spit out pyruvate. But if the pyruvate cannot get processed by this key enzyme, pyruvate dehydrogenase, pyruvate will build up and it will turn eventually into lactic acid, which mm. every even mainstream doctor will tell you it's a terrible thing. It's elevated in diabetic people. It's elevated in insulin resistant people. It's elevated in old people. It's elevated in people with cancer, with, with heart disease. In fact, the two key biomarkers for, for a recent heart attack is elevated creatine ki kinase, it's an enzyme that's present in muscles and uh, all muscles, especially the heart. And they, they, they're looking for a specific form of it that's only present in the heart. And the second test is high levels of lactate dehydrogenase enzyme. And the third test is elevated levels of lactic acid. So mm. high lactic acid, bad thing. You know, it's not a good thing. So if you eat fructose, you're not only helping the glucose get, get properly uptaken into the cell, but once inside of the cell, the fructose activates that enzyme pyruvate dehydrogenase, which allows the fructose to continue the metabolism from glycolysis stores throughout the, the, the other two big steps, the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain, and eventually get converted into carbon dioxide and water. So fructose has a number of different beneficial effects. I don't know why it gets demonized. I think uh, some people, uh, uh, some of the initial studies that fed fructose with combination uh, with a lot of fats. Now, I think that's where the most of the bad rep is coming from. Most mm. of the so-called high fructose studies are actually studies that added fructose on top of the already high fat diet. So if mm. you're already obese and insulin resistant and you start loading up a lot of fructose, pure fructose, that's probably not going to, going to do you much good. Mm. In order to benefit from, from the increased carbs in the diet, the, the amount of fat in the diet should kind of decrease proportionally. Not mm. too much. I think, I mean, you and I discussed just before the show started that for female fertility, you don't want to restrict fats below 15% of the daily caloric intake. Um, mm. It may be necessary if you're a very competitive athlete because it's mm. going to make you very lean and your physique will look great, right? You'll be very lean and, and, and you know have a lot of endurance. But sometimes looking really good on the picture, if because at least what society currently considers looking very good, it's not very healthy if you want to have babies. And the same thing applies for males as well. Males that have less than 10% body fat, which is considered competitive bodybuilder level, have mm. trouble conceiving children. In which order makes to sense. produce sufficient, Could, yeah, yeah, because your body feels sufficient unsafe. Amount of testosterone, you need actually a decent amount of fat. Be, be, without that, you can make enough cholesterol. And mm. without cholesterol, you can produce sufficient amount of testosterone. Amazing. It's so amazing, Georgie. So let's do a quick recap. So focus on lowering or eliminating fish oil, seed oils, flaxseed oil, all of those, all of the pufas, um, soy, corn, uh, Oh, yeah, definitely. I we, we yep. forgot to say any of the so-called phytoestrogens, such yep. as present in soy or any of the legumes, actually, because soy is a legume, right? Mm. So beans, soy. Uh, lentils tends to be okay. Most of the studies did not find an estrogenic response, even though uh, like a, like a lentils is also a legume, right? Peanuts, mm -hmm. also a legume, right? High on PUFA and high on phytoestrogens, particularly there are two ones that are present in all the legumes, genistein and daisy. These two have been demonstrated conclusively to mm. actually do really two really bad things. Number one, activate the enzyme aromatase, which synthesizes estrogen. And if that wasn't bad enough, both of these actually are more potent phytoestrogens themselves than even the estradiol, which we produce in our bodies. And it's the main estrogen both men and women produce. These two phytoestrogens, that's why they call it that way, they can mm. bind to the receptor that estradiol binds to and activate it at even lower concentrations. So they're more potent than estradiol. Uh, multiple studies have demonstrated that if men consume more than a glass of soy milk per day, they very quickly become infertile. Same wow. is true for women. 
Yeah. Wow. So avoid the phytoestrogens, avoid plastics because they leach, a lot of them leach uh, these uh, endocrine disruptors, most of which actually are estrogen agonists themselves. They're mm. estrogenic, like bisphenol A or bisphenol type S. Now they're replacing the BPA with BPS and saying, oh, look, we got rid of BPA. But guess mm. what? They're not telling you they replaced it with BPS, which is an even more potent <laughs> estrogen. So it's like a it's like whack the mole game, right? So they the when the population finally wisens up that there's something in the in a household product that's really killing us, the mm. industry will say, "Oh, don't worry, we're we're gonna get rid of it." Yeah, but they replace mm. it with something just as bad, or if not even worse, because it's not they, they didn't they, they they're doing everything possible to keep mm. costs low. So they say, well, tell us, tell us what part of our product is bad. And they say, oh, the bisphenol A. Oh, we're going to remove that. No, the response is we're going to get rid of all of the bisphenols. But that is very expensive. You have to start mm. reducing plastics from from like things like cellulose, which is much more expensive process. They're biodegradable. They're good for you. But guess what? They cost like 10 to 15 times more. And companies are all about the bottom it. line, right? They're not yeah. going to do it. Um, and then so focus on getting your fat from saturated fat. Yep. Juices, fruits, ripe fruits. Have some ruminant, starch if you meats, want. Meats from yep. ruminant animals, animals. like lamb, goat, yep. beef. Um, all of this is great. Mm, um, even duck lamb. meat is actually pretty good. Like if you mm. remove some of the fat, mm. uh, if the ducks and the chickens are eating like mostly pastured raised, they yep. actually prefer to eat a lot of like uh, insects like living and... organisms. Yeah, insects yeah, and yeah. They're worms. omnivores, aren't they? they yep. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So fruits, juices, you know, add salty meals, and then you can finally, if you wanted to take some aspirin and niacinamide. So yep. there, you ha- there you have it, guys, Georgie. Oh, that was so amazing. Thank you so much. And I will, do you do aspirin? You don't make it. I aspirin, do aspirin. Hey? I, I, I yeah. take it on a daily basis. Yeah. Oh, no, I mean, do you not, do not, it? Do you make it in your supplements? Uh, we have it as a topical yeah. product called Solban. Uh, yeah, cool. Basically, yeah, I, I just thought that it's, there's no point because people can buy it like from any yeah. store around them yeah. and get it pretty cheaply. And, yeah. and just wasn't something that, that I thought people would be willing to ship from overseas to like get that stuff. So I think though, if you're going to take aspirin, you can take some of your vitamin K too. Hey, the yes, yeah. yes, good yeah. point. Yes, because yeah, so because it thins uh, your blood after about 500 milligrams. Yeah, you're starting to get into a, like a, a little bit of a because uh, it thins the blood, right? Yeah, and for many people, that's a good thing because many people suffer from like o- overactive platelets and their uh, increased platelet aggregation. Yeah. So everybody over 40, you know, the general recommendation is like if you take a baby aspirin, it reduces your risk of a heart attack. That's mm. because the aspirin thins the blood. But if mm. you, if you can't t- taking it consistently. And let's say you were not at risk of platelet aggregation, yep. then you may be risk an increased risk of bleeding. And vitamin K actually stops that process and, and r- removes that risk. And usually the general rule of thumb is one milligram of vitamin K for yep. every tablet of aspirin. So say, so is that 100 grams of aspirin? No, no. If you're no. taking like 500 milligrams of aspirin, that yep. means half a drop of quinone, but because it's two milligrams so one, per drop, right? So one, one drop. drop of, yeah, so yeah. if every 500 grams of aspirin, take one drop of milligrams. Quinone. Every 500 milligrams, milligrams of aspirin, sorry. which is usually one tablet, yep. one, one milligram of vitamin K2. Yeah, because here in Australia, they're like 300 grams, usually 100, but that's fine. 500 to one gram of, yeah, so just take yeah, one fine. drop. And I'll, I'll pop the link down anyway to Georgie's site and the vitamin K that you can order it. So, um, oh, that was so awesome, Georgie. Thank you so much. I really glad, appreciate glad it. You- find it interesting yes like hopefully yeah. you see it's, it's so simple all of these all of these remedies are available to us it's yeah. just a matter of like well and also uh, avoid stress as much as possible stress really is a killer i mean you yeah. we're just you talking about before about really the bloody destroying your health oh, right? yeah. totally the bloody stress of trying for a baby now we're just gonna have a break which will be so i feel less stressed already instantly yeah, it is. And, it is and amazing. I, and I suspect you'll come back pregnant. So probably, hopefully, well, who knows? We don't know. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. <laughs> but thank you so much, Georgie. Appreciate you um, as always, and I'll pop all the links to um, Georgie's um, sites down below. Thanks Excellent. so much. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Hopefully, it was useful. We'll talk and, again uh, soon. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Georgie. Bye. We'd we'll be glad to. 